I feel so safe here. We were joking the first time we were here. Like we never, we always forgot to lock the car door. Oh, that's fine, dude. It's El Salvador. The more you get understand a topic, the less willing you might be to take risks because you can see where it could go wrong. You can't forget that life is really just a journey inward and the life outside outward is a reflection of that. Well, good morning there. Jordan Erbs, uh, thanks so much for joining me today, buddy, on the Ridiculously Human podcast. Thanks for having me. I'm, I'm excited to be here. <laughs> we had a we had a few little testing moments this morning uh, with uh, with our Zoom, but uh, that's just the joys of uh, of podcasting, bud, and um, doing things like in not the sort of necessarily best location. Sometimes I know you're setting up a, a new studio there, so. Yeah, exciting times for you uh, in, in El Salvador, hey? Yeah, totally. In fact, I was trying to, I was going to set up in my living room with my beautiful view behind me, get the lighting right, but uh, I don't have internet yet. So I've been using a hotspot on my phone and I actually ended up using my whole 20 gigabyte plan in less than two days. <laughs> so yeah, instead I'm over here in the, the boring white wall studio. <laughs> That's cool. But it's, I think it's always a cool thing though to like, look back on you know you like you go to those first videos of, of a new setup and you're like oh yeah remember that I, we had nothing on the walls and it was just plain and you know we we're running out of data on our phones and it's i think it's just such a cool thing to do you know because most people they don't start things so they don't ever have those things to look back on so it, it's it, i think it's a cool part of the journey yeah it's definitely yeah i mean for me I'm a content creator, I'm a videographer, I'm a filmmaker, I'm a storyteller, and like, there's nothing worse than just a plain white background. <laughs> it doesn't matter what part of the story it is, but I mean, at the end of the day, it's about the content, it's about what we say, it's about the conversation material, so uh, I'll let it slide. <laughs> yeah, I totally hear you, but listen, I'm, uh, I'm definitely not where I normally am. Um, so my background is also pretty horrible. Please, please don't judge me on that. <laughs> hey, you got the title of the podcast back there. I'm impressed. I just yeah. realized like, oh, cool chalkboard. It's actually not a chalkboard. It's actually a wall that they've painted black and then you can just use chalk on it. So I was like, that's an awesome idea. You know, like, especially with little kids. I mean, you know, they love drawing on walls and stuff. So my, my daughter, I just give her some chalk and I'm like, you can draw on the walls, but it's, only the black walls, okay? <laughs> so, Is it a certain kind of like blackboard paint? I have no idea. It's not, I'm just in an Airbnb to be honest at the moment. So I, I don't really know. It, it feels like it's just normal paint because the chalk doesn't really go off that easily. So you have to really rub oh. it and clean it properly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, classic. So, so what's it like? I mean, I know you, you posted the other day, you are sort of like, you know, in inverted commas, home alone in your, in your new home there in El Salvador, like you your kids are not with you, your wife's not with you. Are you feeling a little bit lonely or are you just kind of too busy at the moment? Well, today is the first day where I'm actually more or less just chilling. And I'm actually been thinking like, oh, what am I, what am I gonna do in my daily video about today? I gotta come up with a story. So that's been kind of a fun little challenge in my head. But yes, I have been very busy. That's the reason I came alone because as you know, you have a young daughter. It's hard to get things done with little ones running around. And that's actually another reason when my wife and kids come, they're going to bring my parents. So we're going to have a little help for about six days so we can run all the errands and really just take care of everything. And so this isn't my first time actually doing this. This is actually my fourth or fifth time to El Salvador alone without them. And each time was kind of to scope out the next step of, OK, how are we going to move here? How are we going to move here? And I took it a lot more slowly this time. We started our little family right when the COVID lockdown started. So four years, four years, four and a half years ago, we got trapped in Argentina the first year. Then the second year we were in California with my family. The third year we moved to Hawaii in a rush. And we, I built a house uh, off grid, solar power, water catchment, trying to go food, uh, everything. And our second had just been born. Our second was four months old when we moved to an off-grid cabin <laughs> in volcanic Hawaii. And it was just a shit show. Um, but I digress. Basically, I took a few, quite a few trips alone to get the living situation ready. But my point is I rushed. Like, we rushed to make that move. Uh, I was kind of caught in a grip of fear. Like, 
of Russia, Ukraine. I'm like, oh man, World War Three is going to be coming way faster than anyone thought. So like, we got to get out of here. At least like, you know, if they pull another COVID or something crazy happens, I want to be in paradise <laughs> and then like let the world burn. I want to be in paradise. So we rushed the family over there and it was pretty chaotic. It would have been chaotic anyway. We lasted two years living that way in Hawaii before we just had to throw in the towel. Like, this is just not the life we want. Like, even when our kids get older and we're not living in a tiny house, uh, it's like, then we're living in a tiny house with older kids. Like, <laughs> so uh, that two years was full of building the house, doing the interior, taking care of this, taking care of that, planting trees. Like, I had no time to build my business. I had no time to really like, do like the dumb the things you need to do to make a living in this world even if you're trying to live off grid in hawaii i haven't been ready to fully i haven't been able to fully just cut the cord with society and uh maybe i will one day but now that there's kids in the picture i was like i don't know if that's uh the right decision to make for their future so that's essentially the line of thinking that led us to el salvador and uh you know, I've been checking this place out for a few years and following along, you know, and as a filmmaker, storyteller with a specialty in behind the scenes, real life guerrilla uh, documentation, I guess. Uh, I saw Max Kaiser running around down here and I was like, man, I wonder if I could get a hold of him. Max Kaiser is a big Bitcoiner face financial guy and <laughs> he's a character. And I was like, I wonder if I get a hold of him and I wonder if I get him to hire me to just like follow him all around and just make videos of his life. Cause the dude's so entertaining, you know, uh, controversial, I guess he makes some people cringe, but like, he's just a character. And I thought that would be so cool. And that was the beginning of 2023 which was our last year in Hawaii. And so at the end of 2023, I, I met Michael Sovereign Mindset down here and uh, we scoped it out and everything was really magical. So, hey, this could really work. This could be really cool. So then came back a few times. The, the final time I came back with my wife and we found a house. we found furniture. Like my wife just killed it at like Facebook Marketplace. And, and she's Argentine, so she speaks Spanish natively. So that helped. But uh, like she just killed it and we got everything taken care of. So now the point of this long winded story is uh, within a week of the rest of my family arriving, we'll be completely set up to start living as opposed to the two years it took to get our whole house built and everything in Hawaii. So suffice to say, I'm pretty excited. Um, yeah, I got like five more days before they get here. Uh, but, you know. I'm, I'm enjoying the time. I got lots to do. People are enjoying the content I'm making. I got a guitar yesterday so I can finally just chill out properly. But yeah, so that's uh that's the roundabout way of answering your question. I'm, I'm here alone, but I'm feeling good. That's super cool. But I mean, it's interesting, like El Salvador, some people will, will like, you know, that are not say like in the sort of Bitcoin community, they'll go like, Jordan, are you kind of like crazy? You know, I mean based on what people's knowledge of it in terms of recent history, it was, used to be one of the most dangerous places basically in the world. And now it's obviously turned around completely. Like what has your experience of it been so far in terms of, you know, say like, I guess, living standards politically, uh, these sort of things. I feel so safe here. We were joking the first time we were here. Like we never, we always forgot to lock the car door. Oh, like, that's fine, dude. It's El Salvador. Like, <laughs> Uh, no, I feel ridiculously safe. And I mean, it, it, it helps that we're in a pretty new, modern, contemporary living area. It's very suburban. It's not what I envisioned for my life, but, um, I think at the end of the day, we're born with a certain karma and that's just who we are. And I'm just a guy that happens to live in suburbs, whether I'm in California, Los Angeles, Cape Town, or San Salvador, I am always in the suburbs. And this is how it's been for me all over the world, anywhere where I've planted my flag for a few months or years, I always end up being in the suburbs. <laughs> and I've always told myself that I hate the suburbs. But anyway, it feels very safe, partly because it is the suburbs. Uh, we live in a nice neighborhood where my kids can ride their scooters, their bikes on the street, you know, no problem, a little cul-de-sac. And uh as far as just 
The general feeling, I mean, anyone can just look at the news and see, you know, it's the safest country in the Western Hemisphere now, statistically speaking. I have not had anything happen to me to the contrary. And I was laughing about it yesterday with our buddy Matias, our little producer here, <laughs> because there's just like guys with shotguns everywhere. And I was at the music store after getting that guitar. And as we were leaving, like they had these big amplifiers, these big speakers outside blasting rock music. And right as we were leaving, like a new song started with this like, dun, dun, dun. and uh, like that happened right at the same time, this big armored truck came in and these two guys with shotguns like jumped out. And like, I, I was like suddenly in a movie, like a heist movie. I was like, oh my God. And then I realized it was like one of those Garda, you know, like, you know, to get the money, make sure everything's safe to go to the bank. But like, you just get used to seeing security guards just hanging out in the neighborhood with big shotguns. Kids, you know, like 19 year olds, security guards just with shotguns. And like, historically speaking, I know that there's a very good reason for this to be the culture, right? And so it didn't take, it actually didn't take very long at all to get used to it. And I've been trying to kind of wrap my mind around you know what? I prefer this to actual police everywhere with shotguns, right? Because the police is kind of like a unit. They take orders from above, whereas the security, they're like, you know, they're kind of private police for your neighborhood. So, you know, at the end of the day, they have your back. So my mind, ever since I had kids, goes to like worst common scenarios. I'm like, so if there's some kind of uprisings, a military coup or something like who would I trust, the police or my private security, right? If there's going to be guys with shotguns everywhere. <laughs> so these are just things that come into my mind coming from a culture that doesn't have guys, you know, armed men everywhere. But at the end of the day, everyone's really friendly. I've never felt anyone with a rifle or not rifle without a rifle hostile towards me, like never once. Uh, I have never, I mean, like... You're from South Africa. I've spent time there. Didn't feel super safe in some areas. Uh, I mean, I couldn't go out at night. I was in the suburbs of Cape Town and everyone's like, no, you don't go out at night. Like, I'm like, oh, I can't take the bus and get in like after seven. They're like, no, like you don't do that. I was like, oh, okay. Um, uh, and then my wife's from Argentina. We've lived there. I've spent a lot of time there. I feel safe enough going out at night, but you know, there's a good chance. I mean, we were in the suburbs of uh, a city in Argentina and my wife was in the living room with her aunt and cousins. And I was at a bar down the street and it was like 8 p.m. Wasn't very late. And just right outside the house, someone broke the back window of the car to grab the spare tire. And that was a common thing, you know, steal the spare tire. And like when they asked the neighbors, everyone's like, no, we didn't hear it. It's crazy. But it's like a common thing. And so like even my wife, I was like, you know, we're, we're getting out of the United States. Like I want to go to El Salvador, but I'm also open to going to Argentina if you'd rather go there. She's like, no, I don't feel safe in Argentina. <laughs> so all this to say, we feel very comfortable here. Uh, comparison to lots of other alternatives that I've experienced, it feels great. Yeah, that's amazing. And, and you know what I think is so cool, like, and is for me gives a lot of hope in the world is like, you know, you look at many countries now and you're like, oh my God, everything's just kind of going to ruins, you know? And, you know, I guess El Salvador, they have like literally turned themselves around in the matter of a few years. And, and you now look at it and you're like, so, okay, cool. So if the right guys come in power, then there really is hope, you know, you can turn things around and you can do it quickly. Um, so I, I think it's really cool, like what's actually happening there. And it's, you know, so, so, it's, there's always hope, which I think is the, is the message. And I think people must always remember that no matter how bad things are, there's, a, there's an opportunity for things to turn themselves around. Yeah. Well, I guess hope is kind of the, the crux of religion, right? Uh, I guess we call it faith, but to me, it can be the same thing a lot of times is you need to have some kind of optimism for the future, whether that's, oh, I put my, tra my trust in God or Jesus or Allah or whatever you want to believe in, uh, the universe spirit, uh, you know, you're putting your hope, you know, you just, because at the end of the day, that's all you have because you can't control a lot of things. Like there's a saying I kind of follow is I, I surrender, I, I control what I can and I fight for what I can control. And I surrender to those things that I can't. And that was a big lesson for me in Argentina during 2020 
because like the lockdowns were bad there. I mean, like we couldn't even like leave town, like checkpoints, you know, uh, and then the embassies were closed. So we were trying to get back to the United States, but the embassies were closed. I couldn't get my son's passport. <laughs> so like I was going through some deep shit. And this is after 10 years of being a nomad completely free. You know, I didn't have a job. I didn't have money, which I think makes you more free. But like I experienced just like ultimate freedom anywhere in the world. I did whatever the hell I wanted. Like, and then suddenly within like three months, you know, I was not free at all. And like, you know, not just because of having kids, uh, having a kid, but like, you know, COVID. And so uh, it was like, it was a real, it was a real process for me. It was a real, it was a real deep thing, but that's kind of what, how I came out of it was, you know, there are things in this world we just can't control in this life. And it's up to us to recognize what we can control and what we can't and not stress out about the things we can't control because that's it. Like, it's just how it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, life is like complex enough, you know, so why sort of bring these other things into your life that you can do absolutely zero about and then end up having like endless nights like of no sleep or just operating in this sort of state of semi-anxiety because you're worried about some stuff that might never ever happen. So I totally, yeah, I love that concept um, of just you know, control what you can or, or, you know, worry about what you can and everything else just flip and put to the side because, you know, you, know, you just can't do anything about it. So And looping it back around to hope, uh, which is where I, I started that from, is just like when you have that mentality, just like when you have faith in God, you know, or you have trust that everything's going to be okay, that is a form of hope because you just know, like, there's things I can't control, but I, I'm... We say I know or I believe or I trust, but I think it's really just hope. Like, it's gonna be okay, you know? Like, <laughs> so yeah, as, as things happen all around the world, to your point, you know, we are left the United States, hopefully, for semi permanently, because I, I don't have a lot of hope there right now. But it is true that it doesn't mean it's the end, right? It's a big ship to steer. Like, you, you know, big ships don't go down so easily. They may be harder to turn around, but they can still turn around. And on the other side, like El Salvador is kind of a small ship. It's easy to turn around, but it could also be easy to turn around in the opposite direction. And so I, I, I do think they're working hard to make sure that there is a foundation for stability here. And it can't turn around that easily. But it was definitely an unknown, at least for the president's first term. Like, oh, what's going to happen? Is it going to go backwards? But now that there's another five years, I think a lot of people are like, okay. I mean, people like myself are like, okay, let's see what's up. Let's see what can happen in the, for the rest of this decade in, in El Salvador. So, yeah, I think it is a beacon of hope and light. I think people see that in Millet in Argentina as well right now. I don't know... If it's the same situation, I have my reservations about him down there. There's still a lot of manipulation and nasty business in the world. I think Bukele here has had time to prove that he's not about that. And maybe that changes in the future, hopefully not. But I think he's proven it. You know, you can talk all you want, be a politician, but like when you actually show the work, you know, prove it, then like, it becomes a lot easier to trust someone. And this is coming from someone that like, I don't really believe in statism to begin with, <laughs> but uh, it is really inspiring to see a leader that's actually trying to make a difference and doing it. So it is, yeah, hopefully that means there can be hope everywhere else. Cool, but I, I was reading some of your bio on, on Twitter and it was like, I mean, you, you've got had such an amazing uh, journey, you know, and the long and, bio. Yeah. The long one. Yeah. Um, oh, okay. So I just want to read part of it. Cause it's a nice kind of sort of platform to, to launch a couple of things off. Uh, you, you wrote, I developed my creator skills by having fun with friends in high school. After a brief stint working in nine to five, I decided I'd rather be broke than sell my time. So I spent 12 years traveling the world, making videos with people with no stable source of income and never more than a few hundred dollars to my name. I discovered the value of a sovereign mindset. Anything is possible, but only if we go for it. My goal was to become a YouTuber, but life had other plans. Instead, it was my creator skills that supported me. Everyone wants and everyone needs video, 
and many are willing to trade room and board for it. So I developed humility and by doing so created opportunities for myself through the Americas, Europe, Africa and Asia doing what I love. So I mean 12 years traveling the world like I always say that traveling is like literally the best teacher you can have. Uh, how did how did you find it? Oh, dude, that's a very broad question there after reading that little bio too. By the way, I'm glad someone read it. I don't know if people ever read that, but I'm glad it uh, resonated with you. Thank you. Yeah, no. So, I mean, I guess maybe let me, let me tighten my question a little bit then for you. So, like, I don't know if you, if you studied or anything like that. I, I never, but I went overseas when I was 18 and like I've traveled the world literally ever since, you know, and I'm, I'm 44 now. And oh, really? Wow. Yeah. So it's, uh, I, I think you just learn so much about what the world has to offer. Uh, you learn about other cultures, uh, just other ways of living, um, how people operate in different countries, like what, what different, you know, th- how different things work in different countries. And I don't think there's like you can't actually put a price on that sort of education, you know, you don't become siloed in your thinking. You, you create this new world view, like a, a much broader one. So maybe that helps with just sort of like, I don't know what, what is, Oh man, this used to be my favorite topic. I would write. So I did study, I studied French. I mean, okay. So I went to college. I went away to college, hoping I would like get away from the type of life that I'd grown up with. It turns out everyone I grew up with went to that same college. It felt the same suburban. So I, uh, I saw the study abroad office one day and it said, Oh, you can go abroad as a second year. And I thought, Oh man, I think that's it. And like, I was doing everything. I was 18, doing everything I can to stay sane. I started bodybuilding, you know, counting every calorie, planning meal. And this was like before it was cool, right? Like lifting weights and all that. And so I had like hobbies. I still made videos and, you know, I stayed up to be. Anyway, I go in that office and this is, yeah, second year, you can go to China, Mexico, France, or I think Germany. And uh, I chose France. For, you know, my story at the time, like looking back on it, I was like, everyone was like, why'd you choose France? Because at the end of the day, I, there was a group of like 45 students from the school program and all of them were girls, but like four of us and only two straight guys. And so everyone was like, why did you choose France? You know, obviously it's not a place like the guys. I'm like, honestly, uh, Disney movies. I loved the Aristocats. Uh, which is in France. Uh, Beauty and the Beast is in France. And I grew up with a lot of Disney movies. Uh, I knew Daft Punk was from France and I liked Daft Punk. <laughs> but other than that, like I knew what I, I didn't like those other countries. Like Mexico is Mexico, Germany, uh, you know, World War II. And then China, you know, aren't they communists? Like, nah. And so like France was just the most attractive to me. And I had been to Europe before, but never really stayed. So that's kind of what started the whole thing. And so I, stu- I ended up finishing my degree in French, French literature. And during that time, I had to study Spanish also. So I did go to Mexico. I studied in Mexico also, and I loved it. And I'm like, oh, I should have just gone to Mexico the first time. <laughs> and uh, But that definitely started off the journey. And so then to answer your question directly, and the reason I'm telling all this is because then I after... After going to France, I came back, I was in my third year, I was going to be in my third year. And I was like, I can't go back to school. There's like no way. And just to give a little background on how my education was in France, we we're in this small town in Provence and we were like in like kindergartner for gringos, like for Americans, like they would just teach us French. Like this is the table. This is the kitchen. Like that's how it was. And, but we were getting college level, university level credit for it. (laughs) So it was a joke. Uh, But what happened was we rarely had class on Friday and there were a lot of holidays and like stuff on Monday. And then Ryanair, which is a cheap airline in Europe, like 20 euros round trip, like anywhere in Europe, they'd have these sales months in advance. So we ended up just like taking all these trips all over Europe for 20 euros and just like skipping Thursday and not coming back till Tuesday and getting like these five day trips with 20 euros for the plane and same price for food and everything. So we just started doing that all the time. And the teachers didn't really care if we showed up or not. They're all French. 
Like I, like I remember smoking cigarettes and drinking wine with my teachers during a school break, like a 10 minute break at school. And I'm like, this is so French. Like later I would realize like why I was drawn to France. Cause I love that aspect of the culture. Like they just don't give a fuck. Like they do give a fuck about the things that are like really important, which is why they're great at protesting and things like that. But French culture is just so laid back about things like, like schooling. Right. Anyway. Um, so I was just traveling everywhere. And then by the end of that year, I had, I was couch surfing. People were staying with me. I was staying with other people. This was the golden age of couch surfing. I don't know if you did that in your time, but like I was telling our friend yesterday, who's 24 and he's starting to travel now. I'm like, it's a bummer. Like couch surfing was great. Now everyone's on Airbnb and that culture has kind of deteriorated. But back then I made so many good friends all over the world, all over Europe in this particular story. And I never paid anywhere to stay. I, I never paid for accommodation. And like, I got to travel the world like on a total shoestring and make awesome friends that I still have to this day. Like, and you kind of can't do that anymore. Uh, so anyway, I was doing that. And then I had two couch surfers staying with me. It was the last few months of being in France. And I was like, man, I can't go back to the United States. Like, uh. And we started hitchhiking. Cause we wanted to go somewhere where we couldn't get Ryanair flights uh, to Lyon. And like, we had to take a train, but it was like 40 or 50 euros. I can't afford that. So we're like, why don't we hitchhike? So we started hitchhiking <laughs> and I had never done that before. Every, you know, everything you learn about hitchhiking, like, oh, murderers and all that. And we just had the most magical experience. And then the lid was off, like it was over, like say goodbye to the Jordan everyone once knew, like I was gone. I was hitchhiking everywhere. I didn't go to school anymore. <laughs> like I was just all over Europe hitchhiking and meeting girls and just like living the life. And uh, so finally went back because, you know, I had a, the plane ticket in advance, right? Like for the, you had to buy the round trip, you know, before you left uh, the States. And I go back and I'm just like, I can't go back to school. And so I had a job, I had a foot in the door in Hollywood from an old family friend and I was in Hollywood working, making good money, just doing computer stuff that I like, like to do like audio video stuff. And I was with a bunch of middle-aged people that like, you know, had families and bills. And I, after a few months of that, I was like, uh, I can't do this either. Like <laughs> I can't do this. Like, and so I found a school in Vermont in the Northeast that had like a build your own program thing. And it was an accredited university and they said, Oh yeah, you, you know, get, get accepted and you can just build your own curriculum and you can do it from anywhere. And I was like, Oh cool. I want to do that. So I went over there, I did the orientation and then I went straight to Costa Rica. <laughs> they, they figured out my curriculum. They gave me the reading list and I was like, all right, peace out. And so I went to Costa Rica. I lived on like $4 a day. I lived in a tree house on a finca in the middle of the jungle, just like, you know, chopping down banana trees and picking coffee berries for this lady. And anyway, that just started this next phase. But during that time, just go back to the original question. Part of my curriculum was to read a bunch of travel stuff, including, do you ever read Rolf Potts? He wrote a book called Vagabonding. That no, book I didn't will change actually. That book will change anyone's life. It's called Vagabonding by Rolf Potts. And uh, he's still an author. He writes a bunch of travel stuff, but it's all just about the magic of vagabonding, of not having anywhere to be, not having a return ticket, and just knowing like I'm free right now. And all that happens as, as the self-discovery in the form of just being somewhere new around people you don't know and cultures you don't know and how, how really important it is for us as humans. So he, I read that book thanks to this one professor, and then there were a couple other a couple other things to read. And then one of the final projects for that semester was to write a, a research paper about I don't know it was something about life. And I don't like doing research, right? But I love philosophy and I love thinking about life. So I ended up writing this whole dissertation about why everyone needs to travel. <laughs> I used quotes from these books I was reading and like, and, they, and then the, the professor like basically emailed me back. He's like, Jordan, this was not the assignment. 
<laughs> this is not a research paper. It doesn't tick any of the boxes and I can't give you credit for it. And like, this is like the main thing you have to do for your. So I was like, fuck it. I'm not going to go to your school anymore either. <laughs> and so by this point, I had come back to the States. I was, uh, you know, out of money. So I was back at that job and I was like, you know what? I really miss being around people my own age. Like I really miss being around young college age kids that just want to like do the th same things as me. So I went back, I tried to go back to my old university, the original university. <laughs> and, uh, it turns out I had dropped out wrong. Uh, I had never actually dropped out. So I didn't have to re-enroll. I didn't have to reapply. I just had one semester of F's on my transcript because <laughs> I didn't drop out right. So I got to go back to school. And to wrap up the story, as soon as I get back, the, I met with the professor of French and he was like, I think you should get your degree in French. And I was like, why? He's like, because all these classes you took over there, you get all this upper, upper level, level credit. I was like, Really? So it turns out from that year in France of me dicking around, smoking cigarettes with my teachers, not going to class, I got like almost two years of upper level credit in university for it. And that is the only way I ever would have finished university if it weren't for having those experiences. So yeah, I mean, I'll let you talk for a minute, but yeah, the, to discuss how important travel is, or what it can offer us is definitely a topic near and dear to my heart. But what a story, man. Like, and you know, it's, it's amazing. Like you're probably a little bit anti system, but it sounds like the system worked really in your favor there when it came to, to getting a, a degree. Uh, what I really love is the, the kind of idea of living on a shoestring and what it can actually teach you and the importance of, being a free spirit, you know, and that ties in with what you were saying at the, at the beginning about not really worrying about what you can't control. So that's obviously like a, something that feels like it's, it's deep inside you. There's another thing I'd like to touch on. And it's, it's like kind of seems like a weird thing to talk about. It's, it's self love. And you come across as this really confident guy but it doesn't sound like that was always the case. Uh, you know, I, you, you wrote something that might sort of, you know, form a nice sort of base to, to, to discuss a couple of things on. You said, eventually my chaotic lifestyle began to culminate with me surrendering to love. After my first ayahuasca ceremonies, I could recognize the lack of boundaries and self-victimizing tendencies that I carried with me, restrict, restricting me from developing any further until I finally took responsibility. I was learning to love myself. That's about when I met a woman who helped reflect what loving oneself really meant. Since I was practicing what it meant to put my own well-being first, for the first time I was actually able to fully receive someone else's love. I don't know if you can maybe just talk a little bit about like being a victim and why you thought you were sort of in that mindset, even though you were living this pretty audacious life. Was that in my Twitter bio? Yeah, that was there. Oh, okay. Right on. Oh, okay. <laughs> Are you patting yourself on the back? Like, yeah, that's well written. <laughs> I think it's great writing. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. And that woman was my wife, by the way. She's now my wife. As you well know, things change as you get older and your priority changes. Uh, your way of looking at things changes. Your situation changes. Your environment will change if you're traveling. And so I had gone most of my 20s just doing my own thing as a free agent. And then by the end of my 20s, early 30s, I, I was like, you know, it's really time to start uh, figuring out this relationship stuff. So I, you know, brought a few girls into my life and, you know, we explored and I had one Australian girlfriend for about a year and like, it was a full-time job. Like we triggered each other in every way, but we had so much love for each other. But every time there was a trigger, we explored it together. And like, we got really deep and really uncomfortable, right? But we just trusted each other so much and that changed everything. And I always will credit her and I'll always love her. And we said goodbye because it was just both of us were like, all right, like we can't have a, full, a relationship as a full-time job. Like we have other things to do. And so it was a really powerful year though. We traveled around Australia. Like we drove from one, we, you know, drove from the West coast, sorry, to the East coast to the West coast. And, um, 
and Hawaii and a bunch of stuff. And then we went to Colombia and like we broke up in Colombia at an ayahuasca retreat center. <laughs> and so um, saying goodbye to her actually led to the ayahuasca re- um, ceremonies that you read. And that was when I realized like, oh, in all this relating with others, not, not just with other people, but with the world, I really was a victim. I saw myself as like, why can't like, and I hadn't always been that way. It had somehow developed. Um, it, I wasn't like that when I was, I mean, okay. The th- thing that comes to mind, I was 20 or I was 19 in France and I was hitchhiking, right? And I was like waiting for hours and hours and hours in the sun. Some guy dropped me off in the middle of the highway, freeway, like busy freeway. And I was just like stuck. And I was like really getting down. And this is part of hitchhiking. It's you just get down after like waiting for hours and hours and hours. And I always found it like a fun mental exercise. Like, how can I stay occupied? How can I stay optimistic? Like, and that, a, the, a different hitchhiking trip I did, I brought an accordion. And that's how I learned the accordion. I just traveled with an accordion hitchhiking and people loved it. People always picked me up because he doesn't pick up an accordion player. But I also had a lot of time to just practice. And but um, I would these activities would help me just like stay on top of my mental state, because when you're waiting, you're getting hungry. Right. You're tired. You're hot. Like it starts to, you know, take a toll on you. And so the story that comes up is I was in the middle of that freeway and I was just starting to feel really bad for myself. Like, oh, fuck, you know. But I also knew that I put myself in that situation, right? Like this was my choice. Um, so like situations like that, I can't remember actually ever being like, oh, the world is out to get me. But something changed along the way. And I don't know what or how. I did become a vegan for a few years. Maybe there's something to do with my physiology there. Um, but anyway, that relationship ended. I did the ayahuasca. And during the ayahuasca ceremony, I was cold. They didn't have enough blankets. Uh, there was no room by the fire. So I was over there and like, I was starting to just vomit and really trip out and I couldn't get comfortable anywhere. Like the whole point is to get safe and warm so you can just kind of disappear and pull your consciousness. But I couldn't do that because my physical being wasn't taken care of. And I was just like crying. And I was there during the ceremony crying on in the dirt, looking at a few ants walking by with the, and I was just realizing like, Oh my God, I'm just pitying myself. Like how disgusting, like, like not how disgusting it wasn't like that, but I was just like, look at you, Jordan. Like, is this who you want to be? So I made myself get up. Right. And I made myself like figure it out. And I like found the strength and I found my voice. I was like, I need a blanket. (laughs) I figured out how to say it. And anyway, that's a different story that, that whole ceremony. But that's when I realized was like, I, I've been victimizing myself like when the girl or the relationship doesn't work out how I want it. It's because I'm not communicating well or I'm not just taking responsibility for myself and I'm putting it on the other person to do it and expecting the world to do that when I'm not doing it. (laughs) So that's really what led me into like that's I think for me at the time was true self-love is take responsibility when it's uncomfortable or when you want to put your blinders on. It's like, there's a reason it's uncomfortable because you got something to explore there, something to figure out, something to process. And it could be a long time thing, could be a quick thing, but you know, our psyche works in complex and mysterious ways. And I think that's a, a really big part of life that we can't forget about was we, as we come into financial stress and we work and kids and all this stuff is we can't forget that life is really just a journey inward and the life outside outward is a reflection of that. I love the fact that you said, you know, you, you kind of need to take responsibility and I don't think many people Maybe many is not the right word, but I don't think lots of people uh, sort of do take responsibility in life for the way they behave, uh, the way they maybe view the world. And I, th- I don't know why exactly. I-, I assume it's maybe a fear thing because taking responsibility means that you, you know, you need to look into kind of to your shadows and you need to look into um various other things about you. And, and that's not, not necessarily a nice place to, to go sometimes. 
So, but, but it's, it's such an important place to venture, uh, to actually grow and get, get out of your own way. I've been thinking about this and my grandparents, I have one left and they've all been on their way out like in the last few years. And I just see how they live, how they've always lived, how they talk. They've, they don't self victimize at all. Like they are, they've never been the victims. Right. I look at my parents. I look at how my dad lives, my mom lives, and you know, I study them, right? From my childhood to now. They don't victimize themselves. And then I look at me and my siblings. We all share that syndrome. And I'm not blaming this on my parents. I look at my friends. I look at my peers. I look at my generation. I look at TikTok, right? Like, you know, you see it everywhere. There's something about what happened uh growing up in the 90s maybe even the 80s that began to encourage this behavior and raising your kids so they they you know they can feel bad for themselves so it's like it's okay to feel bad for themselves there's a book called the coddling of the american mind by uh eight and uh forget but um they talk about that in more recent terms of how our culture has just been like coddled like no one knows how to fend for themselves, take responsibility because it's like, oh, it will have, you know, the government will take care of you or mom and dad will take care of you or like everything's okay. And no one knows how to do anything on their own. I think it started a lot more than I, I, I think it's probably started in the eighties, uh, whatever it is. I'm not trying to throw out conspiracy theories here, but I do recognize it and I don't see it in the older generations. I feel like they just owned their shit. They took care of it. Uh, I do see them blinded to a lot of stuff too when it comes to psyche and trauma. Um, it's not like I'm trying to just glorify them and demean my generation, but like I just I just noticed that they didn't they didn't have that victimization mentality, and uh, I do enjoy the fact that I get to explore it. So, so I'm grateful to have been blessed with the perception to recognize it. And to decide like, Hey, I don't want this for my life. What am I going to do about it? And having this journey, parts of me could feel like, Oh, I'm wasting time. Like, oh, all the stuff I could have got done. But what's ironic is that as soon as I started exploring that, figuring that out, like there's, they say a two month integration period after ayahuasca. And, um, I started exploring that. And suddenly this is, this is actually, I said earlier, I couldn't think of anything where I would feel bad for myself, but I, had this memory of when I was probably know, seven or eight or nine. And I was at Christmas with all my cousins, the whole family, and my grandpa was Santa Claus. And there were all these presents everywhere. And Santa Claus would, oh, this is for Johnny. This. And I didn't get a present. Like it took like almost to the very end. And there was no present for me. And so I eventually just left. And I was like feeling so sad and so bad for myself. And I didn't want to say anything. Um, I don't know if I, I didn't want to complain. Like I, I, I wanted to feel bad for myself. I didn't want to be like, what the fuck? You know, dad, mom, like auntie, where's my present? Like I just left to feel bad for myself and I like hid under a table. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I just remember now, like during that last relationship with the Australian, every time I would feel bad for myself because she wasn't fair to me, uh, she wasn't accommodating my feelings that, that, Christmas would come to mind and I would use it as a, as a gateway to feel bad for myself, to cry myself to sleep. Now it's not like I did that all the time, but I did do it. Okay, everyone. Okay. World. I cried myself to sleep feeling bad for myself because of a Christmas like for 20 years, 30 years ago. But my point is, is that I kept that. Is it trauma? Is it really like trauma to say I didn't get a present? I guess emotional, uh, but uh, I kept that with me and I held on to it as a way to feel bad for myself. After those ayahuasca ceremonies, I would notice this, that trigger, like something happened that wasn't for me or some woman didn't like accommodate me. And I noticed, I noticed like that, that neural pathway, like wanting to, to go down that route. And like, it just couldn't, it stopped. And I tried to grab it and I couldn't, like, I could not feel bad for myself. It just, it literally rewired something in my brain where like, I just couldn't feel bad for myself anymore. I couldn't pull that. I have that memory now as just a memory, 
it's not like a, tra- you know, you know, those memories that bring up trauma and like, you know, they trigger some emotion. It's, it's no longer that it's just a memory and I'm sharing it on a podcast and laughing about it. But like, I couldn't feel bad for myself anymore. And then sure enough, like I said, two months later, I met my now wife within four months of meeting her, we were pregnant and now we're five years into having a family together and life is amazing. So my point with all of it is that I, I, I do truly believe that having the opportunity to explore my psyche in that way, this victimization mentality, whether it's a product of me or my parents or my society or what, who cares, exploring that opened up what was necessary for me to create life, to bring life into the world. I never wanted to be a father. I never wanted a family. I never had any desire for any of that. But now here I am and I love it. I can, I can totally relate to definitely the last bit that you said there. <clears throat> and, um, but I, I want to talk to, you, you said something there that is like really, really almost crucial. Like uh, it's, it's kind of related to trigger therapy, right? So you were saying with your Australian girlfriend, like, you know, you would get triggered and blah, blah, blah. And but what people don't understand about triggers, which you used, spoke about awesomely there is that it often a tr- certain triggers are stem from things that happened when we were younger and people don't even realize that you know so like i don't know you whatever the situation might be like you might always get triggered when i don't know someone talks loudly to you like like as if they're raising their voice and they're a bit angry and that could be because your dad when you were like three years old he flipping screamed at you because I don't know, he has sleep deprived and he flipped and did the complete wrong thing, but you always held on to that, you know, and it, it, it actually, that sort of trauma, I guess, uh, means that we behave in a certain way our whole life uh, and until we start to explore it. So it truly is a thing that like they say, when you want to sort out your triggers, you need to, you need to sort of, sort of go back chronologically, like, you know, backwards and find out what it is. Like, what are these things? What, when does it happen? Like, why does it maybe happen and stuff? So that's, that's probably why you don't feel that way anymore because you, you came to that realization, shit, this is nine year old Jordan. And he, he, that's what's sort of been driving a lot of his reactions. Crying a lot of the, the table. Time. <laughs> uh, I, I appreciate the vulnerability there, bud. So <laughs> I'm giving, I'm giving nine year old Jordan a hug right now for you, bud. Just so you know. <laughs> Me too. Yeah. Much love. Yeah. Um, it's so that all came apparent to me and, you know, it's funny, I'm looking back at my life pre fatherhood, like I had so much time to explore consciousness and all now I'm just like, get off the wall, uh, make money, figure shit out. Um, but we went to, my wife was five months pregnant and we went to Peru to see if maybe we would want to live there. And I don't know if you've been to Peru. Or more importantly, I don't know if you've been to Iquitos, Mm -hmm. which is a little town, a city on the, basically in the Amazon, but they say it's the gateway to the Amazon. Uh, You have to fly in. You can't get there by road. It's full of motorbikes and tuk-tuks, very few cars. Anyway, we were five months pregnant in Iquitos because I wanted to do ayahuasca to clear out some shit, getting ready for my son to come into the world. And I didn't want to do a lot of the things my dad did. And so... I just remember we're on one of those tuk-tuks bouncing around the potholes. And my wife was like, I'm pregnant. (laughs) Like, like Jordan, I can't keep doing these adventures with you. Uh, But she's great. And you mentioned earlier, travel is so great for all these things. Travel is also a great way to know how you get along with someone. Traveling with someone, especially in a romantic setting, will answer all the questions that like it'll take years living with someone to really start to get to know them. But travel with someone, you get to the heart of everything really quick. Anyway, uh, before that, though, in Iquitos, we went to the Sacred Valley and outside of PSAC, I did my first uh, Wachuma ceremony, so San Pedro. I had done San Pedro before in South Africa, actually. Up north, there's a festival. I forget what it was called. It was like close to Namibia. But I was up there in the desert. And this guy I was staying with, older guy, he had all these San Pedro caps. And he was like, oh, yeah, just eat them. But I ate them one morning. And then we went on a hike to see these uh, 
paintings of the Bushmen, like cave painting of the Bushmen, the Kalahari Bushmen, right? And they just want to be called Bushmen, the correct term to say. Uh, and we made a video there and it was awesome. Anyway, um, on the way back, me and my friends decided to like go a different way. Actually, we didn't know the way. Everyone was kind of just going back and we didn't go with the guide. And it wasn't long before we realized the whole desert looks the same. <laughs> and we are not Bushmen. We don't know how to read the rocks. <laughs> and we're looking around and suddenly we're like, we're lost. Like we had a general idea of where to go to get back to the festival, but like we are lost. And then finally we were like, all right, I'm going to, I was like, I'm going to climb this. Cause I think from there we can see where we need to go. Um, and so I went up there and I was like, yeah, we got to go this way guys. And they were like, I don't think so. I'm like, oh, we got to go this way. I know it. And they were like, well, you could go, we're going to go, we're going to turn around. And I was like, fine. So I went alone. <laughs> I have no water, nothing. And, um, suddenly I realized, oh shit, like I'm very lost. I don't know where I am. And that's when I realized the San Pedro had kicked in. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I created my own walkabout situation here. Uh, with this, not like a serious Wachuma, you know, but like enough San Pedro to feel it, you know? And I wandered and wandered. And anyway, I eventually saw my friends across the valley and I screamed, shouted, and they saw me and they came back and we found the trail to get back and everything was fine. That was my first San Pedro experience. So the second was in Peru. And they say with Wachuma, you really get to commune with your ancestors. And I thought, okay, that's perfect because like I'm trying to not pass on karma from my ancestors to my son. I recognize everything that had happened with my dad because of his dad, because of his dad, because of his dad. I was like, I want to stop a lot of this shit. You know, I want to, I, I want it to stop with me. So we did this Wachuma ceremony and I, if I get too deep into it, I'll start crying uh, because uh, still to this day, I can't talk about it without crying. It was really beautiful. Basically what happened was my uncle who had just, my great uncle who had just died was there, was there with me. My grandpa was on his deathbed. He was kind of there with me, but not really. But who was really there was my great grandfather, the alcoholic um, abuser of his wife and children, abuse in several different ways. And he was there. And I, it's not like we talked, but we were just like kind of like one. And he had never gotten any love because, well, first off, his father did the same shit to him, but also because afterwards everyone was like, that guy's an asshole, like, fuck him. You know, no one like sent him love or flowers when he died. Um, and I had, <laughs> yeah, I had kind of made a connection with him on LSD at a psychedelic music festival in Hungary a few years before. And I realized I kept a lot of uh, his stuff in my hips. And right when that connection happened, it was really funny because he's Hungarian and I was in Hungary. I was on the highest dose of LSD I'd ever taken. And I was just laying in this field, looking at the stars. And right as I realized this thing, this connection with him, then suddenly this Hungarian folk music band started playing literally like three feet behind me. I don't even know how they got there. And they started playing this song of celebration. It was the trippiest thing. Like I said, I'm Hungarian. He was Hungarian, you know, and then this, I was in Hungary. They start playing this Hungarian folk music and everyone starts dancing. And I was like, whoa. So I had, I had made efforts from that point to kind of like try to just send him love. Like, Hey, you know, let's heal this rift. And uh, so then that, that Wachuma ceremony, he was there and What's really interesting is the whole thing started with me thinking about the night before when I got upset with my wife in the kitchen for something stupid, you know, like just me being upset with something stupid. And I was thinking about that and going, God, that was stupid. And then suddenly it wasn't me anymore. And I was holding a knife at her in the kitchen. And when I snapped to, I realized, oh shit, like this is something that's happened ancestrally, right? Like, this wasn't, I didn't hold a knife to my wife in the kitchen last night, but someone has in my past and I carry that with me. And that's what started it all. And I realized like when I was just kind of embodying his experience, I guess to say, I guess my dad's and my grandfather's as well, but it was most powerful with my great grandfather because he was the only one passed at that time. 
was that throughout all of this, and this is where I start to cry, I'll try not to cry, Gareth, uh, his wife who loved him, just like my wife who loves me, and my mom who loves my dad, and my grandma who loved my grandpa, always forgave them him, them, him, because they're just unconditional, loving goddess. Like, that, like the ultimate archetype of that energy, of that sacred feminine energy is what these women have always embodied, despite the fucking hell that we men have put them through in my lineage, whatever. And so during that time, my grandma, who had just passed, suddenly enveloped us all. And it was just that energy of there's nothing to forgive. Because I love you. Because we love you. Like, and so it really, it was really powerful. Still to this day. <laughs> and then I had Rose in my hand and she became the Rose and I knew I had to say goodbye. And one petal at a time, I threw the Rose away. But um, yeah, so that Wachuma ceremony was all about just trying to like clear that so I could get ready for for my son and like not have to yeah the reason i'm telling this whole story is because we were talking about like healing this shit uh from ourselves but i'm like what if i can just not pass this stuff on to my kids so they have less to deal with later right <laughs> and you know i've mentioned karma a few times you know we as fathers do the best we can it doesn't mean we're going to be perfect we all we all do the best we can with what we've got and we can't judge ourselves we can't blame ourselves we just got to do the best we can stay on top of it. And so, yeah, I mean, I learned a lot from that. I, I think I passed a lot on from that, but it doesn't mean I don't fuck up still. It doesn't mean I, I'm not an asshole still sometimes, my wife. and brings it up. You fucking Wachuma, it didn't even work. <laughs> she was um, that's when she's triggered. But yeah, I mean, so... That's when one of my big goals is like, I just don't want to pass this on to my kids. And I really just want to live in peace and be able to be patient and be able to take responsibility for myself. So these kids can have, I mean, as fluid, as smooth as a journey as possible. Like imagine what we can get done if we have less trauma to heal, you know? And so like, I know every, they're going to have something. There's always going to be something. But like, if I can give these kids just the best upbringing they can with as little trauma from me, from me fighting with my, with their mother, all this shit, we can just like remove that as much as possible from the equation. Then I'm just doing probably one of the, hopefully one of the best services I can to them. I've had some really great stories of uh, plant medicines and that's definitely going to be a hard one to top, bud. So, so thanks so much for sharing I actually think that not passing on sort of generational issues is one of the sort of highest forms of consciousness. And many people don't, they just don't even realize what they're passing on to their kids. You know, they, they don't realize their, their own wiring and, and uh, what they've sort of got from their parents and, and all these sort of things. And they, they often just sort of carry it on, you know, and uh, you know, their kid might do something and then they get triggered because that's what their parents did, et cetera. So like, I really think it's a, one of the highest forms of personal growth, consciousness, whatever you want to call it. When, when you do get to that sort of state where you become so self-aware of how you are acting and how that will impact your kids that I just, yeah, like you said, hopefully, you know, hopefully the, um, more people, sort of start realizing that. And I think there is this nice renaissance that's going on at the moment. And we're ultimately leaving the world in a much more sort of healed state and uh, a lot more, providing a lot more hope for this sort of exciting, deep um, future that, 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 you know, we know we can ultimately live as a, as a human species. So I love what you're doing. I think it's uh there's so much there for people to, to sort of reflect on themselves and, and be honest with about themselves. The catch 22 about it is like, I don't know about you, but I don't have time to do psychedelic plant medicine, anything anymore. Right. With the kids, you know, with providing for the kids, with everything I'm like, Oh, like 
like I mentioned, like catch myself slipping a lot and I don't know, I'm not always able to catch myself in time before making a mess. Parts of me think like, oh, if I could just go do, you know, a ceremony for a week, you know, like go out into the jungle and like I can come back to like, uh, but that comes back to taking responsibility. Like, well, no, I just, this is it. It's time to deal with it. Like, got to do it, Jordan. And like, that's it. Like, I got kids around. I, I can't do, you know, a mushroom trip, you know, on the weekends like I used to be able to or whatever to like stay on top of my consciousness. And so kind of like how I mentioned earlier, things change, right? And now I'm in my 30s and probably for my 40s too, like there just won't be that psychedelic lifestyle in the same way where I'm just always reminded of my consciousness, the structure of my consciousness. And so I, I do what I can. I do yoga every morning, you know. I do still have my things that still allow me to live life during the day after or before. But uh, yeah, it's just really interesting how uh, I, yeah, it's like, <laughs> as much as I want to say like, oh no, I really need these things to come back. I just have to, like, I'm at the point, all these, what those things taught me is like, no, you can do it, dude. <laughs> you can do it. You know, you can do it. And when the time comes, you'll do it again. But you know, you can't, you can't control that anymore. You have to surrender to when it's time and, and it'll come. I think you've, you've crossed like at least the abyss, you know, like where you before you, 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 were, you would have been a completely different person if you never d did that. So at least you've, you've taken those first few steps and uh, you, you weigh, I think you're way more ahead of than most people, but you'll be surprised. So it's not a competition. No, no, it's not a competition. I know, but at least you, you're doing your bit, you know what I mean? Um, and because uh, I know, I mean, geez, if I had to share this podcast with some of my mates, they would be like, are you guys fucking crazy? Like, what are you talking about? You know, so, so we're, we're at that level where for you and me, it's like, it's kind of normal, but other people are still way far, like, you know, stuck in whatever their reality is. And uh, to them, this stuff is like, you just, you guys have just, you've actually taken too much of that stuff or, you know, what are you smoking or were you, were you drinking in that podcast or something? Because that's just kind of, our realities are often, you know, we're so far different. Like we're so different in terms of our steps of um, how we see the world and how we've developed ourselves. So I would also just say or argue or like some of us, myself included, I think just had bigger walls to break and it required all that for me. I've met super evolved people that never really done psychedelic you know, and they just had less trauma to deal with, less, less of that shit to deal with, to get through. And they were able to arrive at like, same conclusions, I guess, or similar, similar conclusions, different path entirely. So I don't want anyone listening to think that like, that's the way to do it. Uh, I think it can help speed things up. I think if you're someone like me who is thick headed, thick ego, uh, lots of pride, then, um, psychedelics, uh, plant medicine can help a lot, but so can travel. I mean, travel is what opened up me up to doing those things anyway. Like I would never have even considered doing anything like that if I wasn't in, I think the first time I did mushrooms was in Amsterdam, like on Christmas day, you know, I was in Amsterdam and like, we just smoked weed and ate mushrooms, went to the park and like, that was it. And that was just because I'm like, yeah, dude, I'm traveling. Like I'm in a new country, like it's snowing outside. Like I'm never in the snow. Like this is awesome. Uh, I'm with like a guy from Japan, a guy from Scotland. Like we're all like here in the hostel and it was magical. And that's what like got that became my association with those, with plant medicine, like adventure and new things and new people, magic, but traveling itself, arguably very, 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 very strong, better tool for a lot of this. I mean, if you look at like the greats, look at Terrence McKenna, look at Jack Kerouac, you look at, um, Neil Cassidy, uh, I don't know, you, Will, William Burroughs. You look at a lot of these big names that were really into psychedelics over the years, over the decades and decades, they were big travelers. They did a lot of traveling. They had a lot of adventures. So I think there's something to say about that. They can go hand in hand. Yeah, I totally, I totally agree. Like, a, you know, like you said, you might have a bigger wall than other people. So you, you need that sort of, that, that 
uh, mechanism to crack whatever it is to to really open you up. Uh, but not everyone not not everyone has like you know some of the the trauma that 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 you had or issues that you'd experienced or childhood that you had like you know so so definitely it is a tool but it's it shouldn't necessarily be your first go to tool either uh, so so yeah I just just as we kind of wrapping up here but I I do like one of the things that drew me to you initially was just watching some of your videos on Twitter and. Like, I think video is such a cool way to communicate. And I noticed that like recently you're like, okay, cool. I've had a little bit of a hiatus. Like now I'm going to start pushing the video a little bit more, even though I've always been this video <laughs> content creator. And the like, there's something super special about uh, how you can connect with somebody over video. Um, and like, how you came across like your authenticity and what you were sharing was like, okay, cool. This guy's a cool bloke. I want to sort of, you know, speak to him. So you, you actually have a, a content creation course or video content creation course, if I'm not wrong. Like I mentioned, I never had money. I never, you know, figured that stuff out and suddenly, Oh, a child on the way. I need to figure out a business. I did different things to try to get started. I I've always been able to kind of like make a buck but it wasn't sustainable, like make a, a large chunk of money and then it disappears. Right. So, uh, that's kind of what kept going. And then last year I was like, you know what? I got to figure this out. Like I need to, I need to make a business. I need to figure it out. So I started on Twitter to brand myself. I started a podcast. I, I knew I wanted to make content. Um, like I mentioned earlier, I'll never sell my time again. I mean, even though I do now, but I sell my time doing projects with clients that I, I really enjoy doing. I sell, I sell my time working with people, coaching with people that are like, I, I, I love what they're doing and I want to support them. Like the same people I would make videos with to trade for room and board back in the day. It's because I believed in what they were doing. Now it's the same thing. If I believe in what you're doing, we'll work together, except now I get paid for it <laughs> as opposed to get room and board. Uh, so I started branding myself and the whole part of one of the things I offer is supporting anyone, uh, figure out how to get free. So the last few years of my traveling, I was taking, I took a 16 year old along with me once his parents asked me to take him traveling because he was from Texas and it was just having a really tough time. Took him away for a month, traveled, hitchhiked through Europe, changed his life and has never been the same. And I got a great review from that. And I was like, I'm going to do a business like this. Right. And I took some people traveling along the way. That was the only time, actually that time I wasn't even paid for it. They just paid all the expenses, but I was like, this could be a really cool business and I can keep traveling anyway. Then COVID happened. So none of that harsh, none of that happened. And so this time around, I'm like, okay, I want to make a brand. I want to make a business that I can take with me anywhere. I was living in Hawaii, so it had to be remote. And the whole Part of why I support people in doing this now to get free isn't just like before it was like, come get free through travel. Now it's like, come help yourself get free by creating a business online. And so the first step to that is making content. If you have no idea what you're going to sell, you have no idea anything, like just start making content. That's really my thesis. And I call it the content vine. You have a vine. There's four quadrants in the vine and each coil of the vine, uh, like a, a spiral really that keeps getting bigger. Uh, it starts with content. It turns into business. It goes into, uh, essentially self-development and then it goes into self-actualization, self-development and purpose, really higher purpose. And then that self-actualization contributes to better content and then it keeps going. Uh, so this is like a formula I've kind of discovered and I've been cracking the code on lately, but Content creation is huge. <laughs> and so uh, a year, about a year ago, exactly. I was like, okay, I got to figure this out. And I know I'm going to figure it out by making content. So I did that. And within a few months, I was charging money for a course, for a cohort. People were paying for it. And I was like, oh my gosh, wow. Like I never even imagined that. And you know, soon I was charging a few thousand dollars for a few month course. And then I, then people, I, I reached the point of realizing like, okay, I can't charge anymore without like offering my time and services as video editing, all of that. So it's been pivoting. And now I'm in the midst of really honing in. 
I've honed it in. Now I'm in the midst of like communicating like what this is, but really I'm just trying to encourage people like, Hey, like, and making a bunch of free stuff for people to learn the basics of it. And maybe eventually they'll hire me. That's the whole point is you figure out something you're good at naturally that you enjoy. You show other people how it's done, show that you're the expert at it. And then eventually, you know, you, you lead them along, they trust you. And then eventually they'll want to hire you for it. And so I'm following that same path. I'm proving the content vine basically. And so I'm making contents again. Now I'm getting these courses ready. I've made several courses, but I've always just done them live with clients. I've never actually packaged them because I really wanted to make sure they were good before putting them out there to sell. But this next month, I'm going to package my first course. It's going to be, you know, a hundred bucks or so it's going to be all everything you need to know to get started making video. How to how to shoot, how to make sure you got decent lighting, what cheap mic you can get, how to edit it later, how to add subtitles, how to do everything on a budget so you don't have to hire anyone. That's the first thing. And that's part of this whole process has been figuring out, like I said, I've been making videos for 25 years, like is figuring out what people want to know, how, what people, what are people's problems? What are their pain points? And other people, they have a lot of problems getting started or they're shy on camera. So I have a free seven day email course. It's called the authentic video challenge. You sign up, you get seven days every day in your, in your inbox, you get a new prompt and a lesson about video creation and a prompt to go practice and then an exercise exercise. And so that's something I've been, I've created. And then this content vines is a two week course, two week email course I created that I'm going to turn into a proper three month coaching program. And that is the whole shebang from creating content and turning it into a business. Because I think that is the ultimate freedom, right? If you can figure out how to make content about something you're interested in, how to, and then turn that into a business with people that are cool, that share your values that you want to work with, like what else can we really want in this life as far as like livelihood? Like we've won, (laughs) we've done it, you know? (laughs) So yeah, that's a bit about what, what I do in that sense. That's really exciting, but and I mean, it's so cool that you've discovered what it is that you sort of like really want to do, or like you, you've always kind of known, but now you, okay, you're like, cool, I'm going to make money from this, which is, you know, going to give me the, the opportunity to provide for my family and to, to not have to worry about that sort of part of life and to then build other things and have maybe a a bigger influence, maybe not bigger, but better. So I think it's great to go through, you have to almost have to go through all the things that you've gone through to understand what it is to, to actually do it, you know? So it's super cool that you, you've got to the stage. Cause I actually think a lot of people would have tapped out by now. They're like, okay, nah, screw this. I'm going to get a job somewhere. So that's the thing. I've tapped out so many times. I didn't go get a job after, but like, I've been trying to build my own brand and business online for since 2010, you know, and I couldn't figure it out. And I could, I couldn't quite crack the code for how it worked for me until this last year, I finally did it. And maybe there was an, uh, an element of urgency and necessity and that, and also some humility, like I realized like I can't have so much pride. I got to like learn from other people. I got to do what other people do. And, but, um, to loop back around to like, I guess the rest of our conversation about trauma and psyche and like healing and all that is recognizing that I had a lot of trauma or fear or whatever you want to call it around sales, around pricing things, around recognizing my own worth. And so in the process of the last year of trying to build a business online, it was a huge thing to see, oh, what do I charge? And not just about what was someone pay, but like, what is it worth for me? Like if I'm gonna start selling my time, for example, doing things I like, but like, if I'm gonna do that, like, what is it worth for me? And I've learned now, like, I just don't work under a certain price if it's doing certain things because I just decided it's not worth my time. Like I'd rather, rather be, I'd rather not have the money. <laughs> And um, this has been an important lesson. I think it's anyone coming from the regular world of just having a job, learning sales, and this isn't me, okay, but I agree with it. Like many people say this, learning sales is one of the greatest skills you can have because you don't just use it for business. You use it with going out on a date, use it with your kids. You use it with anything, you know, learning to 
help someone make a decision that also happens to be in your favor, but learning that process, it's very psychological and it's just important. And so what I think I was getting at was how important it is to, when you believe in what you're doing, like I believe in what I do. Like if I was say Gareth, like I got to know you and you, you know, you want to do video and you want to do this, but you're having trouble there. Like take this course, this content finds course, like it's going to change your life. I promise you. And so if I just tell you that, like, I do it, do it, do it, do it. Like, oh, you'd be like, okay, Jordan, like maybe whatever. Like it might sound like I'm begging. Right. But if you go through the right sales process, it comes across as by the end of it, you realize like, oh, wow, I really do need this. And on the seller point of view, my perspective, perspective, it used to be like, oh, like it used to be that scarcity mindset, like begging, like, hey, you know, like, come on, like, maybe not even that. I'll just be like timid and hopeful that they want to pay me. But now I'm so excited about what I'm offering people. And I know what it can help solve for the right person that will be on a call or whatever. And I can say with complete confidence, like, hey, do it, like, let's do it. And obviously go through the process. Like, and I don't have to feel like I'm cheating anyone or trying to rip anyone off because I know it will solve a problem. Problem that this product helps solve. I believe in it so much. You know, I put my face on it. <laughs> and that was another thing. That was another thing I had to heal. Like I would have never put my face on something I was selling in the past because I didn't believe in it that much. You know, I've had projects, I've had communities, I wouldn't put my face on it. Uh, and I acted like it was okay, but it was really because deep down I didn't believe in it enough. And now here I am putting my face on it. And like <clears throat> huge, like I, you know, for me, very big. And I think it's uh, something a lot of people should go through. If you're coming from that normal world, like learning how to make an income online, there's a lot to it. There's a lot to start understanding. Video is just the tip of the iceberg, but putting your face on your content is how you start. Making video, showing who you are, building that trust and credibility with people is eventually what's gonna get them to open up your wallet, their wallets for you. And, same thing. If you're going to put your face on a product, first you got to put your face on the content. And uh, it's, it seems to be something that even people that recognize they need to do it, they struggle with it. And then a, a lot of other people know they want to make income online and they don't know how. There's a lot of scams out there like coaches saying, oh, 10,000, oh, do this from home, blah, blah, blah. It's really such a simple thing. It all starts with you. All starts with you like and learning the things you need to do learning the structure learning the process learning the skills and you never should have to pay money until like you're pretty deep in and that's why i offer a lot of things for free until you get to that point like hopefully if i can help you get to that point or finally you're ready to hire someone hopefully you'll hire me because you trust me that i helped you get to get to that point but at the end of the day i've just learned from all this there's like so much People, so many people out there trying to offer value. There's so much to learn out there that people are providing, but there's not always a framework like step by step. And so if you're someone into self-development, if you're someone that doesn't see the world just as it is and you see it as a reflection of yourself, uh, if you're someone trying to create that freedom for your life, if you're someone that intuitively knows you need to make content to do it. And you don't know what your business is, but you want it to be organic. You want it to be authentic. You don't want to force anything because you know if you're forcing it, eventually you'll burn out. If you're one of those people, then you might enjoy what I have to offer. <laughs> um, and so that's kind of like what I'm learning to communicate now in my content uh, is to package things in that way. So I have to figure out, everyone's loving this El Salvador content. I have to figure out how to fit it in there. Um, which goes against my own formula. I think you're going to speak to so many people and they're going to totally relate to, to that, the, all those scenarios that you're talking about, uh, you know, struggling to almost put themselves out there, uh, but also, you know, undervaluing themselves. I think people's relationship to money is something that we don't even take into consideration. And it's a huge, it, it's a huge um, thing thing is a bad, such a bad word, but like, you know, it, it determines how you react uh, and how you behave your relationship to money. And, um, it's, it's a really interesting topic to, to go down. Uh, but, but I was just wondering, how do people get in touch with you if they want to 
find out a bit more about you, if they want to hire you or like do one of your courses? So my newsletter, jordanherbs.com has a, uh, I mean, I, I announce offers in there, but I also just write a lot about life and things I'm learning. And I'm focusing on this thing called multi-purposeful content now. How can we make content that fulfills us creatively, but also supports our business and also provides value to others all, all at the same time? Uh, so you can learn about that in there. There's also a, a book a call link on my website, jordanherbs.com slash book. You can also DM me on Twitter. Jordan Herbs or Instagram, Jordan Herbs, my YouTube channel, Jordan Herbs for number, and then you, just the letter, because <laughs> Jordan Herbs was my old channel that got taken. Um, but I guess you can't contact me on YouTube. But that's where I put a lot of the content that has nothing to do with business. That's just where I put things I'm interested in. That's where my podcast is, kind of a lot of unrelated to business I'm building. But yeah, Twitter's good. Hello at jordanherbs.com. Um, if you're interested in checking out Content Vines, it's in a beta right now. I had a bunch of people do a beta reading for me, and then now I'm like twisting and turning it. But you can also go to authenticvideo.club and you can sign up for the seven day challenge. Authenticvideo.club, that's the seven day authentic video challenge. And I think that's a good starting point if you're ready to take it seriously. Like I like email courses because they show up in your inbox, right? Like if you have to go to a website, log in, like probably less likely to do it. But if it's in your inbox, you're probably going to open it. And so little lesson and then a prompt at the end, like, oh, how do I, you know, what to do today, what to explore. And a lot of the questions will definitely ask you to get a little vulnerable. <laughs> and uh, I think it's important. And I, I also think that I think it's what helps build audiences. True. I think authenticity is actually what attracts people to you. And uh, that relatability element is definitely uh, what attracts people to you. And it's a, it's a much better sales technique than faking it. You know what I mean? So my, my last question is what does being ridiculously human mean to you? I don't like what we just said, the authenticity, the vulnerability. One last story <laughs> where we lived in Hawaii, volcanic area, very impoverished, economically speaking, but very abundant, uh, food, fruits, nature, beauty, Speaking. And the community, huge hippie culture. And we have an ecstatic dance every Sunday morning, church, Wednesday, then a ecstatic chance Friday. Everyone's really into dancing. Uh, a lot of psychedelics, plant medicine being taken, a lot of weed being smoked, a lot of transients, but also a lot of families with young kids like us because they want their kids to go. And, uh, and there's also the main beach, the only beach. I could walk to it from my house. Black Sand Beach. It's a uh, nude, the nude beach. Clothing optional, beach, excuse me. And I would go there every morning, naked, do yoga, do my. And in the beginning, I had been spending time there since 2000. And 2015. And in the beginning, it was always uncomfortable. Like, oh, people are looking at me. And I'm. But like, once you smoke a joint at the beach, why would you keep your, like, you just kind of like, dude, like, it doesn't make any sense to, oh, but I feel so good right now. I may as well do some yoga to feel even better. Like you just, we call it flipping or a friend of mine that came to visit, we call it flipping, like going to travel mode, like coming from, you're like, it takes a few days and suddenly you flip, suddenly everything's chill. Don't bother you anymore, but it can happen in an hour at that beach, right? And go out there, you get naked, you go in the water, you're in the sun, black sand beach, you know, you're smoking, everyone's smoking weed, like no rules at this point, right? <laughs> and everyone's respectful though. Drum circle that happens at that beach, like it's fucking amazing. Anyway, everyone there is ridiculously human. And I am free at that beach to be ridiculous human. There's fallen trees that I'm, you know, doing monkey movements on for my morning workouts, you know, fallen tree, I can do pull-ups on, uh, like I said, all my yoga, people are there dancing, screaming, like just you do you. And one of the big reasons I wanted to live there is because I was free to be ridiculously human. Love that, but there's that free spirit that sort of keeps on coming up and, uh, it's good that it, it still lives in you. So 
Thanks so much. I, yeah, I really want to say thanks a lot for for sharing the stories that you've you've shared. You, I don't know if you realize how wise you are, and I think a lot of that stems from your life experience traveling, and then everything that you've done, sort of on top of that. I mean, I, I know you. I could, I, I, I could listen to you. Mine. I could really listen to you speak for ages, but because I, I really think like living an interesting life, which actually means an adventurous life a lot of the time, uh, makes people want to be around you. You know, you're going to be that type of grandparent that has like the grandkids, you know, oh, sitting on story, the floor yeah. while you're sitting, you know, on your, on your sort of couch and you're going to be telling them these stories. And I always think like when I speak to people and when I coach guys and stuff, I'm like, you want to live an interesting life. That's really what your goal should be because people, you're going to make people want to be around you, you know, and really that's kind of the essence of, of being human or, or one of the essences of it. So you are that man, but I really enjoyed listening to all your stories. You're a great storyteller. And I'm just really excited about what you have coming up. And I'm great that you've realized how to turn your sort of passion into a, into a profit and into a business. So thanks very much, my man. Yeah, man. I appreciate you appreciating me. No one's ever called me wise before. That's awesome. And um, yeah, like you said, yeah, people want, I, I sorry, I'm going to get off and do it. Yeah, definitely. I use that to my advantage, traveling and also meeting girls on dating apps. They're like, oh, this person's interesting. They have adventures, do all that. So yeah, to your point, anyone listening, if you want to be more interesting, if you want to come off as more interesting, definitely go travel, go have adventures and create the stories to tell because they're awesome to live. Uh, they may not seem like it in the moment. Become awesome to tell. Definitely always look back fond. Yeah, it was a pleasure meeting you, Gareth. Thank you for having me on. And I, dude, I really appreciate your encouragement here because um, I guess I don't get seen a lot or I, I'm not told uh, or people don't read that long bio on Twitter and actually like go, oh, wow, Jordan, keep whatever. Um, so I appreciate the affirmations and acknowledgement. Uh, it really means a lot. And it makes me actually want to go listen to all your other podcasts because uh, I haven't had time to even see what the name of the podcast was. I think I saw the name of it, but normally I like to research a bit the, the host and the podcast before I even agree, but I'm just so busy. Father, but you, um, yeah, this might sound really arrogant, but it's like in the way you've interviewed me and the way you see me, it's like it reflects on you, right? And I'm like, and it's obviously going to reflect in your content and the other guests you've chosen. Probably going to be content I really like. I'm going to go subscribe to Ridiculously Human. Well, buddy, uh, that's just such an amazing compliment. So thank you, man. Uh, yeah, let's just sort of keep on encouraging each other, you know, and uh, that's actually a great message to end with. Like, I really think people should invest more time in encouraging, you know, people that are doing good things to uh to carry on doing those things and, and and you often do that by just sometimes saying a one-liner that's like hey man i, I see you and and I, I like what you're doing and you know you're a clever bloke or you're wise or you're interesting and you your life has been awesome like it, it doesn't have to be you know what i mean just just like a one-liner sometimes can really just help somebody and you, i always say to the once again to the guys that I, that i work with like no i, I think people don't people underestimate the influence that they have. And often it's sometimes, you know, just, you could just give somebody a hug. I don't know, like it could be something small, you know, and you, you just, so just never underestimate the influence you can have, I think is a, a nice one for people to, to realize in life. Thank you, brother. Yeah. Well, maybe we can flip the script sometime. And like when I bring my podcast back, I'd love to ask you all these questions if you're down. I would love it. I love talking. I love being a guest as well. So thanks very much, Wade. <laughs> it's an honor. We'll stay in touch, brother. Take it awesome. easy. Awesome.